This morning was one of the, the most spectacular baptisms I think we've ever had at Westwinds. And without overselling or overtelling anybody else's tale, we, we had a, a few folks that had been visiting our church sort of sitting quietly off to the back trying to remain largely anonymous, which is why I'm telling you their story. Um, and, and, and there was a group of three of them, th three friends that had a pretty, pretty dramatic transformation in their lives. They got baptized today. And, and as they got out of the water, they're hugging each other and they're crying. And then they start dancing. They're dripping wet all over the place. And Ben's crying through his bifocals, little diamonds coming out of his face. Then all their family and friends come down to the front of the church. And it's just, they, they just, they just mobbed. It was spectacular. And, and I'd been talking to some of these guys in, in, in the week prior. And one of the things that, that always surprises me, I realize this is funny, but it always surprises me when people say, oh, my gosh, when you get up there, it's like you're talking right to me. And, and I go, well, I, don't, I, don't even, I don't know your name. I don't even know who you are. I, I never met you before in my life. Like, I don't, I don't know anything about you. But there's something about preaching straight from the Scripture. There's something about just, just going through the Word, man, that, that gets hold of people and gets hold of their heart and changes them. We're, we're in the middle of a series here on, on First and Second Peter, and I got to tell you, I love Sunday night church because it's another opportunity for us to have people. we got lots of empty chairs. And, and at some point in our church, man, we, we got to flip the switch from being a church where we, we come and, and we enjoy it and it's, it's fun and we get something out of it to, to being missionaries to our own community. You know, and so everywhere you go, man, everywhere, you, you just got to be thinking, who needs to be in this chair beside me? Because um, if you haven't invited somebody to church in a while, if you can't even think of somebody that might appreciate that kind of transformation, even just to witness that kind of transformation, man, you, 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 got, a, you got a little waking up to do. You got, you got to get your vision checked. Um, because there's lots of folks in Jackson uh, that need to be transformed by the good and holy power of God. Amen. Amen. All right, here we go. First Peter, we're at the end of chapter 2, moving into chapter 3. For the sake of God's great name, be subject to every human institution, whether to the emperor or the governors, for they have been sent by God to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. Man, I, I think it's fascinating that Peter here in this letter tells us that we ought to be subject to every human institution. Because within a decade of writing this letter, the same human institutions that he's telling us to listen to killed him. They hunted him, they chased him underground, they stole his possessions, they stole his family business, all his acquisitions, because he was outlawed for being a Christian. That They accused him of sedition because he referred to Jesus as Lord, and Lord was a title that you were only supposed to use um, in, in relationship to the emperor, and, and, they, and they murdered the guy. So a lot of times people read this part of the Bible and they go, oh, what we're supposed to do is uh, listen to the people in charge no matter what. Well, that, that's not what Peter's advocating. He was running for his life. There's always in the life of a Christian person the requirement for us to critically engage with our minds and with our perception. What the heck is going on around us? So, sometimes we ought to protest. Sometimes we ought to get mad. So, sometimes we, we ought to vote. Sometimes we ought to demonstrate. And, and sometimes not. How do you know? How do you know when it's the right time to stand up and be counted? How do you know when you're you know, in the midst of a big political moment, like, like don't you wish maybe more Christians had stood up against Hitler, right? H how do you know? Well, your pastor's not the right person to tell you. That's your first clue. The way you know is by listening to the Holy Spirit. You gotta let God guide you. You gotta let the Spirit of God pull you forward. But the point, I think, of this letter and of the whole New Testament is that, is that this life is tricky, man. And, and as soon as you find a verse that makes you think you've got a position on something, you, you, you've missed it. The point here is to, to think, to be good citizens, to bless one another, to look after our neighbors, but, 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 but to critically engage our world. All right, let's keep going. They've been sent by God to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. This is a nice turn of phrase. This is God's will, that you live well, silencing foolish and ignorant people. Any, you know any of them? You related to them, married to them, maybe, by chance? Uh, you know, there's the folks who will always say things like, um, you know, all Christians are hypocrites. You ever met people like that? You know the best way to shut them up? J just don't be a hypocrite. That's your best defense. Just don't be a wiener. Like, I got all kinds of people when they find out I'm a pastor, and I hate telling people I'm a pastor. It's the worst conversation killer. You know, you'd be on an airplane with somebody. What do you do for a living? I go, oh, I'm a professor. <laughs> like, you know, eventually, if I got to fess up and I tell them I'm a pastor, then, then, the, like, then the conversation dies. Or then they quickly tell me, uh, always, invariably, a story about a horrible pastor they know. 
And the truth is, like when you're here, I can, I can live in such a way that you can test and see if I'm like the same kind of charlatan you grew up with or whatever, but that, that's the only defense you ever got is how you live. So people say, I grew up with a pastor and he was one way on Sunday and, and the other way, you know, the other days of the week. I'm the same mess all seven days. And yeah, yeah, there's a lot of people testifying right now. That's hurtful, but, but uh, it's consistency. Yeah, I'm consistently <laughs> disappointing. All right, let's keep going, okay? Live free, but don't use your freedom as a veil to hide immorality. I mean, one of the best little pieces of the Bible, right, from the Apostle Paul, everything's permissible, but not everything's beneficial. Look, do, it, do what you want, but don't be dumb. There's going to be a cost. So some of the stuff you do is going to make a mess that you don't want to clean up, so... Don't cry about it if you do it, and maybe don't do it in the first place. Be like slaves to God. Honor all people, love the family, reverence God, and honor your leaders. All right, let's go on to the next slide. You who are servants, be good servants to your masters, not just to good masters, but also to bad ones. Man, isn't this a, a thing that we run into all the time? When you got a bad master, like a bad coach, you, know, you, you get a bad boss. You, you, you got a bad, you know, colleague or administrator, somebody over top of you, and you think, man, they're, they're incompetent. I don't know how they got this job. I don't know what they're doing or, or why they think they got the authority to do it. And you let that one relationship, that one obstacle ruin everything. Takes your joy out of your job, takes the joy out of your life. And, and the, the problem is that when we, we identify, like, the, the, the problem, like the, the bad person, the, the idiot, Right? When we identify them, we think, well, if they would just get out the way, th then everything would be better. But don't you understand that, that you're giving them way too much credit and way too much power? Because if you're sitting there thinking that you could experience the abundant life God has for you if just this one person would be removed, or if just this one problem would go away, or if just your husband would smarten up, or if just your mom would leave you alone, or if just your kids would quit wiping their nose on your pants. I mean, if you've reduced everything to one problem, you, you, the problem is you. Even if you got a different boss, you'd find something to be unhappy about because deep down inside, there is a, 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 a failure for you to recognize that God is bigger than your problems. And, and you got to learn to rise above it. So, so be good, not just to the good masters, but to the bad ones. When you're treated badly for no good reason, endure it for God's sake. There's no virtue in accepting punishment you deserve, but if you're mistreated for good behavior and continue in spite of it to be a good servant, God will bless you. For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. Let's keep going. Christ is your example, and you must follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was Deceit found in his mouth. He didn't retaliate when he was insulted or threatened revenge. He suffered in silence, content to let God set things right. Uh, let me focus on this phrase here for a minute. But before I do, I, you know, I forgot something at the beginning of my message. I can't believe this. Time number four, I preach this. It just keeps getting better and better, and I just keep forgetting stuff. So you got to remind me in like nine minutes that there's a word I'm supposed to tell you. Okay, who is, who's, already, who, who's already asleep? Who can I trust to remind me? All right, Angela, you're my footnote, okay? So you just, just do it like a big Holy Ghost thing, you know, like you're on TV. I'll get you a tambourine. All right, in nine minutes. All right, at 640. All right. But first, Christ carried our sins in his body. I love that image. It's, it's, so, it's so rich. You see, we got all these paintings all around the wall, right? Each, each painting corresponds to the week of the teaching, starting with number one over there, all, all the way down through to week 12. And they're a combination of of cultural images and theological reflections. And, and this week, the, the painting, number four, is, is a, a big picture of Jesus carrying a cross, and then in his body are our sins. But I, I just love thinking about that, because I've got sin. I mean, not, I don't have old sin only. I, I got today's sin. I got the things I'm mad about today, the things I'm grouchy about today, the, the unforgiveness that I'm hanging on to today, the, the, the self-pity that I've got today. And all this stuff is gross, man. And I, I just love the image that there's Jesus going to the cross, and he trips over my, over my sad feelings for myself, bends down and picks it up, you know, like a pine cone, and just puts it in his pocket. And then he keeps going, then he comes across some, well, there's Dave's entitlement. I guess I'll just pick that up, put that over here. Oh, there's Dave's ego, you know, so he just keeps sticking my sin in his body until he climbs up on the cross. And he's a mess. He's bleeding everywhere. He's dying. They jab him with a sword. 
and it goes right through my sin. And I see it, and I go, man, my, my stuff is so small. It's so petty. I sit here and think about how hard done by I am or how frustrated I am or how life's not fair, and then I look at him doing all that for me. I'm ashamed of my stupid little sins. See, he, he put all that in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin. All right, there it is, Dave. There's all your dumb stuff. Now kill it. Get rid of it. It is petty. It is small. Your sins, your corruption, your imperfection. Now move on and live for what is right. Live and enjoy everything that's God is right because by his wounds, wounds we're healed. And that, that's what I want for you, man. I mean, if you're like most of us, you're coming to church and you're a little bit wounded. You know, you got some stuff you're working through. You're frustrated. You're ticked off. You feel like you've been screwed. Well, yeah, maybe you have. And so when you come here, man, I want, you to, I want you to come and I want you to dump all that garbage at church and get rid of it. I want, I want God to heal you. I want you to heal your thoughts. I want to heal your heart. I want to heal your relationships. Maybe that's dramatic. Like maybe you leave here and you go, oh, my God, I just, I think I can forgive my dad. Maybe that's subtle. Like you, you feel seeds of hope growing inside your, your marriage or, or your workplace, whatever. But, but when you leave here, man, I want you to leave healed so that when you come back next week, you, you can testify and you can go, you know what? I'm not, I'm not a victim anymore. Like, uh, Christ healed me. Now, now, I, I'm moving on. Once, we were like sheep who wandered away. But now we've turned to our shepherd, the guardian of our souls. Angela, I got six minutes. All right, good, good. All right. Christ is our example, and you must, wait, wait, next slide. Sorry, buddy. The same goes for you wives. Be good to your husbands, responsive to their needs. Man, he, P Peter's going to talk about husbands here in a minute. And, but I just think it's worth remembering that, that we ought to be good to each other. And, and you know, so often you, know, you get married for a few years or you're in a long-term relationship. The last thing you want to do is be good to the person you live with. They're the person you sort of, you know, cr crap on. You know, you see all this stuff, you hear all these people going, oh, man, I just can't wait to get home, and I just want to put on my ugly clothes and just kind of, you know, vent about the day. And I hear that stuff, and I go, man, I would hate to be married to you. That sounds awful. You, you're ugly and mean. Like, who wants, who wants that in a wife? Who wants that in a partner? Like, that's, and yet, that's, that's what we all crave. we got to remember to be good. Be good. Responsive to their needs instead of just looking for what you need all the time. There are husbands who, indifferent as they are to any words about God, will be captivated by your life of holy beauty. I love that. That the best cure for an idiot is hotness. I just think, you know, and, and we're talking about well, husbands who are closed off or clods or who are thoughtless or unkind. The best way to wake them up to what God wants to do for their life is for you to, to cultivate that, that inner light, that alluring sense of God's presence. So don't let your attractiveness be merely outward, fashionable styles, expensive jewelry. You should dress yourselves with the beauty that comes from within, the unfading splendor of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is so precious to God. Now, a lot of women have used this scripture to hurt a lot of other women over the years. Uh, my mom, for example, grew up in a tradition that you weren't allowed to have makeup, you weren't allowed to cut your hair, it was all a sin. You had to wear um, uh, dresses that came down below your ankles. Because they look at pieces of the Bible like this and go, see, see, the, the way you look doesn't matter. You shouldn't get distracted by that. No, no, no. You do whatever you want, man. The scripture gives an entire chapter describing the outfit you're going to wear in heaven. It gives like 17 chapters describing the fabric used in worship at the temple. It gives another six or seven chapters describing the jewelry of heaven, of God, and of worship. So, so yeah, whatever, man. You wear your Jimmy Choo's, your H&M, your Target mom jeans. You do whatever you want, Okay. The point is that in the same way that that's reflective of how you are, that inner beauty is reflective of what God's doing in you. And this idea of a quiet spirit is not the same as the idea that you should just put up and shut up or be seen and not heard. Having a quiet spirit does not mean being a quiet human being. The best way to understand a quiet spirit is to think about a spirit that has been disquieted. 
And we all know disquieted people. And because Peter's talking here about women, we'll, we'll stick with women for just a moment. But we all know that one lady who's got to let everybody have a piece of her mind, who runs around from thing to thing to thing, banging her gavel, letting everybody know what she thinks, who's going to the PTA meeting with a laundry list of complaints, who's demanding they take her expired coupons at Meyer at 4 o'clock in the morning, and she wants to talk to the manager right now, darn it. We know that lady, and we're tired of her. No, a quiet spirit means when people get around you, they, they feel like they're being put back together, gathered, healed, like honey on your soul. Let's keep going. The holy women of old were that way. They were good, loyal wives to their husbands. And that, that's where we get our examples, right? Not just people from the scripture, but you got, you got great holy women in this room. Godly women in this room who are figuring out how to make it work. You, if you don't know what it looks like to be beautiful, to be godly, to be a sanctified woman of God, elevated to a position of sainthood in Christ Jesus, you, you better make some friends tonight because there's a bunch of them in this room. Sarah, for instance, taking care of Abraham would address him as my dear husband, and you'll be true daughters of Sarah if you do the same, remaining unanxious and unintimidated. Remaining implies that that's the way God created us to be. God created us to be unanxious and unintimidated, unworried and unafraid. And, man, women are so afraid. Afraid of what their husbands are going to do when they get home. Afraid of what's waiting for them, depending on what kind of day he had. Afraid of the criticism of the people around them. Afraid of being shamed, of being hurt by other women, by the opinions of the culture. I mean, it's a crappy time. It's worse to be a girl than to be a guy. I'm married to a girl. We made a girl. It's tougher, man. I watch Carmel parent our kids, and I go, it, this is harder being a mom. You know, I get to be married to her. She has to be married to me. I, I mean, I win. And I think what God wants is for women to feel unafraid, to feel safe, to feel like in and of themselves, they're okay. They can enjoy a man without needing a man. And anxiety, of course, plays into this. Our thoughts are always spinning, going crazy like a little hamster on a wheel. Now, I know that there's no women in this room who ever struggle with anxiety because we fix that with some medication. But the truth is, what God wants for us is a life in which we get to chill out, a life in which we get to experience the peace he promises. And that's what he's promising you tonight. All right, last slide. I got you, Angela. It's 640. I'm ready. The same goes for you husbands. Be good to your wives. Man, be good to them. Honor them. Delight in them. <laughs> kaka, kaka. That was, that was cool. <laughs> I'm coming to you. We're there. We're there. I'm six lines away. Delight in your wife. You know, men will delight in their new girlfriend. Men will delight in their bride. But men do not delight in their wives. Not naturally, not without commitment. This is a command. We, as husbands, are meant to look at our wives and find in them the source of joy. Now, you may go, well, you don't know what she's like. No, I don't need to know what your wife is like. I got one. I, I, I got my own thing going on over here. Yeah, but you know, there's this girl at work. Oh, man, she's so beautiful. Man, if my wife was like that. Listen, this girl might be great, but if you married her, you'd wreck her. Because no matter what you got, you'd want something else. You'd spoil it. You'd poison it until you learn to delight in your wife. That's why the scripture says delight in the wife of your youth. That's why the scripture says let every man be satisfied by water from his own well. You got to stop dipping your bucket. As women, they lack some of your advantages. But in the new life of God's grace, you're equals. Treat your wives then as equals so your prayers will not be effective. Isn't that hilarious to think that maybe the reason God's not answering your prayers is because you're a jerk to your wife? Like maybe you're begging God for help at work and you're begging God for your ambitions and all your, your future dreams and your future plans and God's going, whoa, until we get this thing sorted out, we're not doing anything else. Because this is the most important thing in the universe. You know, at West Winds, we, we, we talk a lot about elevating the status of women. 
we're, we're champions of women. It's really important to me. It's really important to us. Every now and then, I'd love to find a, a real man. I'd love to meet a guy who understood that the time for playtime is over, and now it's time to take care faithfully of the people God has entrusted to us. I want to meet men who look after their families, who protect them, who provide for them, who make space for their wives to flourish. I'm looking for men who are searching for ways to bless their families, not searching for ways to get validation from their families. I'm looking for men who understand that ultimately God provides what only the Spirit of God can supply, which is strength and nobility and purpose, and we get that to give it away. We don't get that from our wives like little wimpy vampires sucking the life out of them. That almost got R-rated real quick, sorry. <laughs> now, again, I, I think we got men like that in our church. And I, and I feel proud of those guys. But we, we got to press one another as brothers to remind ourselves that, that our wives are not resources meant to renew and supply us. We are here for them. Now, I've been dancing around this one word, a word you haven't heard. It took some rhetorical restraint on my part not to say it. It's a word that's used in different translations of the scripture to refer to all three of these issues. It's terrible. It's just stupid. I hate this word. The word is submission. Submit to your authorities. Submit to your masters, your employers. Wives, submit to your husbands. Man, more damage has been done with this word than almost any other word at least in Christian history. We've twisted this word, we've poisoned it, we've contorted it, we've made it, in, we've weaponized it, we've made it into something perverse. And so we hear submit to the government and we go, oh, that must mean the scripture is telling us to be blindly obedient no matter what evil thing our government, no, shut up, come on, don't be dumb. Think. We hear submit to your employers, to your masters, we go, oh wait, that original context was about slavery, the Bible's supporting slavery, oh, come on. It was Christian people ennobled and empowered by the scripture that fought slavery and put largely an end to it, at least in the West, and are working tirelessly to put an end to it globally. So come on, man. Wives, submit to your husband. That mean that she's supposed to be in the back, in the shadows? No, don't you dare. If you're a man that needs your wife to submit, you're not a man at all. You gotta be ashamed of yourself. You elevate and celebrate her. That's why you're here. You're here for her. You're here for her. And that's not easy. And that's not always clear. And that doesn't always feel fair. But you have been called by God to be like God, to sacrifice yourself, to suffer like Christ suffered, to lay down your life for the people the Lord has entrusted to you. You want to do that or you want to cry? Because that's what it means to be a man. Now, the word submit literally means come under. And then we're told that husbands are supposed to be with their wives. The, the Greek word there is the word that they're supposed to be shoulder to shoulder. So if you want to know really what the Bible is saying, it's saying the wife looks at the husband, and she's got to come under his authority. And then the husband looks over at the wife, sees her dipping down, and he goes, well, I'm supposed to be shoulder to shoulder, so now i got to do this. So she looks over, and she got to drop. And then he got to get shoulder to shoulder. You want it. And then, <laughs> that's how it works. It's, it's a mutual submission. There's never a part where he's supposed to be above her. The whole part is that he's supposed to be with her. He's supposed to be looking after her. He's supposed to be the engine, the catalyst, the battery for her so that she can live. Because she needs that, dudes. And if she's not going to get it from you, she's going to find it from somebody else. When we come to understand how the Bible paints these pictures, I think the most obvious question for us is, like, what other word were they supposed to use other than submission? Because submission is a word that has a good meaning, but we twisted it to subjugate, to oppress, to intimidate. If we would have picked any other word, we would have done the same things to it because we're corrupted and crooked. We would have twisted any word to subjugate to humiliate, to 
problem isn't with the word. The problem's with our hearts. And if you want to understand how Jesus wants our neighborhoods to live, if you want to understand how Jesus wants our, our workplaces to be, how Jesus wants our marriages to be, then, then you've got to understand that all the language of submission is ultimately language about Christ. Jesus is God. This is the Christian story in its purest essence. And he left heaven to live here. He submitted himself, the scripture says, to the will of the Father. He came down. And he went to the Middle East, for crying out loud. It's not like he went to Ibiza and hung out on the beach with a bunch of money. No, he lived dirt poor as a tradesman, lost his daddy when he was young, grew up, got into a second career. People hated it for him, and then they murdered him. His best friends betrayed him. And he submitted even to death. Now, we like the idea of emulating Jesus. That sounds great, you know, when he's got long hair in his 30s and can wear robes to parties. Sounds like Hugh Hefner. But the real measure of our emulation of Jesus Christ is whether or not we are willing to submit even to the point of death. You go, I know I'm supposed to commit to my marriage, but it's hard. Yeah, I know. You dead yet? Oh, man, I, I know I'm supposed to submit, but, you know, work, work is frustrating. Oh, yeah. We, we've never had frustrations. No, you've you got to submit all the way, even to the point of death, because that's the end, right? When you're done, when you got nothing left, when you're dead, when you're toast, when the whole thing is over, that's the point where you go, all right, Lord, it's either resurrection or hell. And the clear promise of the scripture is that Jesus will give you new life, new life for your marriage, new life for your work, for your vocation, for your passion, New life for your city, for your neighborhood, for your government, for all that's yours. He promises new life. But you can't get the new life by going around the hard stuff. You come to new life by going through it. These are the words of Peter, Jesus' closest friend, who was martyred by being crucified upside down because he doesn't think he was worthy to die in the same way as his Savior. And he's reminding us, man, that some things are worth suffering for. It's worth suffering for, like, the world. It's worth suffering for, for your passion, your, your work, your, your calling. Man, it's worth suffering for your wife, for your husband. And so God is calling us to be Christian men and Christian women who follow his example in everything we do, trusting that at the end, he's going to fill us up with more strength and more hope than we can imagine. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, thanks for your, for your crazy example. Oh, my God. How could we ever live up to you? It seems hopeless, and then we, we realize... You're the one who gives us hope. You're the one who gives us your spirit. You're the one who lifts us up, who raises us up, who makes us feel like we can keep going even though we're done. And, and so we want to we want to acknowledge that. We want to thank you. And we want to beg for your forgiveness and your grace. Help us, Lord, to keep our commitment to you firmly fixed in our mind. So that we know the way we're married is the way we serve you. The way that we work. The way that we live in our community, man, that's, that's the way we serve you. We pray, God, that you'd receive our lives as an offering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.